Hello and welcome to the Fire in the Belly show. Today we'll have myself, Mighty Pete, and we are joined by the Robert Raymond Realpal. Good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning, Mighty Pete. Glad to be here. Ready yeah. to have just a little bit of fun today. Just a little bit of fun. Not too much. We don't, we don't like to overdo it, right? You know? <laughs> right, because people got to understand that being successful is very serious. You know, that, that you, there's no room for fun. There's no room to do anything but work, 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 work. <laughs> I can I can tell where this interview is going to go and I'm really looking forward to it so Robert tell us who are you what do you do and where are you from uh, well you know as you said my name is Robert Raymond Realpel uh, I am very blessed to be not only an international best-selling author I am an app designer I'm also a serial entrepreneur and I'm also probably the greatest thing I, I really feel privileged about Pete is that I get to travel around the world BC before COVID that is and personally impact over half a million lives so far in the last 18 and a half years, doing trainings anywhere from three and a half to five days long, where I'm on stage for up to 12 hours a day and seeing the change in people that really, it, that's what really lights the fire in my belly. I got to tell wow. you. So that's kind of who I am today. And the, is that your flow state room or Robert? Sorry, is it your, your flow state when you're on stage? Is that, is that the best version of you, do you think? You know, I, it would be easy to say yes, but my practice is um, that I want my flow state to be as many times during the day as possible, especially when I'm off the stage and with family. Hmm. And I want to be able to be present with them because if I can be present with my audience, which is one of my main goals, I want to be present with everybody I interact with, not just when I'm on and when I'm teaching and when I'm you know, doing what I love to do that way. It's even in the times that are toughest where it's like, okay, can I be present now? And be in a flow state now and i hope that makes sense hmm. i mean in general would you be are you pain driven or pleasure driven because you're saying it's when you get in that state right it's the biggest challenge sometimes well you know uh, <laughs> it started off pain driven for sure because you know i wouldn't be here today if i hadn't gone through some ups and downs hmm. and so um being a trainer it started off being pain driven but for the most part it is pleasure driven because I, when someone can come up to me, Pete, as an example, and they say, do you remember when you said this? Here's how it changed my life. That's absolutely phenomenal. But I, one of the things I want your audience to understand right off the bat about me is I'm no different than anybody else. I may be a little more aerodynamic than most people. You know, I, I, I'm not bald, but I do walk 20% faster than most people, right? Because <laughs> I've got the aerodynamics. But um, there is such thing I learned as overliving my passion. You know, I, st I became a trainer for the first time doing my first full-on training in 2004. And the moment we broke the mold, because I was working with a mentor where I was his very first protege and taught his material, also in the next four and a half years, I ended up doing over 200 multi-day trainings around the world. At home on average, only two days a month, I was living my passion, but I overlived it and I got burnt out. And because I wasn't taking care of myself on stage, I also herniated a disc. And I ended up taking what I thought was going to be a year off to get over the burnout ended up being three and a half years. Cause I also went through two back surgeries during that time. And I'll tell you, that's humbling. That's very humbling. And it, I, I realized, yeah, there's such thing as overliving your passion. And so it, it, I think I go back and forth on that question because it started off pain driven, uh, healing my own wounds, what, you know, what was going on. Then it went to pleasure driven because I got to see the pleasure in other people having the, you know, you talk about fire in the belly for me, it's when you see that light come on in their eyes for the first time, maybe in years, that was the pleasure driven. And then it, it goes back and forth. So it's almost like a game of ping pong, can it, can it, can it, <laughs> back and forth. I love it. I mean, is that, is that a good way of describing fire in the belly? Do you think, you know, that light coming on in people, that light inside them? It is. Because how many people, especially look, look at the time we're in right now, hmm. there's people that are excelling. There's people that are reinventing. Oh my goodness. I'm in the middle of a full on reinvent because I've gone, you know, March 10th, 2020, I landed back in Canada from doing a three day training in India, March 11th, I went into lockdown. My world changed all my, um, all my live events around the world canceled hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue gone instantly not sure how long it's going to last and i could have sat there and went oh crap why me this is why is this happening and which i did for a little bit or i could sit there and go 
two very powerful words my wife and I use all the time, what's next. And because of that, we did a full on reinvent that's fire in the belly. And so there's people also that during this time they've shut down, they've lost a lot, not just financial. When, when I talk about success as an example, and that fire in the belly, it's got to be mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, and financial, because we are holistic people. You can't just have one area that you're working on because the area you don't focus on is going to be the area that takes you out. And so when you've got people that maybe are going through the tough times and I can sit there and maybe something I say, or maybe something I can teach them all of a sudden I see that light comes on. That is the fire in the belly because also now when you see it igniting, you know that they can now take it forward. Maybe sometimes it just takes that spark. And if I can be the igniter, I can be the flint that ignites that spark. I'm all for that. And so that brings it back to then the pleasure side of what drives me is it's like, how many sparks can I ignite in this world, especially during this time? Because even though some people may feel it's the darkest time for us, for some people, it's going to be the greatest time for them to be able to truly have the success and the life they really want. And like times like now, I mean, does, does that bring out the best in you? I mean, are you, are, are you a natural sort of recreator or somebody who can take a situation and maximize on it? It may seem like it, but not on my own. Hmm. You know, I've got amazing people around me. And um, I, because every time I try to do it on my own, that's a, that's a disaster. Right? And, and I, I'm sure people listening can re relate to that. And so um, I'm very blessed in the fact that, you know, as an example, my wife and I, we met when we were 13. We started dating when we were 16 married when we were 19 and we just celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary. Now, Pete, do not do the math of how old I am, please. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's, if I have no problem admitting, I wouldn't be doing what I do today if it wasn't for my amazing wife. Because growing up, I was taught, here's the box. Don't question the box. Don't even think outside the box. You just, this is what you do. And my wife came along and, and our running joke is I was innocent until I met her. And then she corrupted me in so many amazing ways because her perspective is what box are you talking about? <laughs> There's no box here. See, if it was just me, I would actually be miserable in a job, but I'd be comfortable because that's what I knew. Yeah. I was taught when you work, if you have a family support, you do whatever it takes. Even if you hate the job, but if it's, if it's giving you some form of security and it's paying you, then you do that job, no matter whether you like it or not. And I look back today and I go, is that living? No, that's existing. And unfortunately, you know, from traveling around the world, I've seen most people, they exist. And that's the fire that's missing in their belly is because they believe that's all there is for them. They believe that's all there is. So um, one of the reasons I can do what I do and I can reinvent is because I have people, what I call growth-minded people around me. And, and Pete, have you ever heard the saying like, surround yourself with like-minded people and you'll be more successful? You've heard that. And here's a question, do you believe that? Well, it certainly helps, I think, doesn't it? It does, but you know, and I believe this, I did for years. And last year, a mentor of mine put it into a whole new perspective, which gave me a paradigm shift. He says, if you're surrounded by a group of like-minded people that are complainers, you're going to be a complainer because hmm. you're all of like mind. He says, what you want to do is you want to surround yourself with growth minded people. And a growth minded person is a person that will be there to lift you up when you stumble. They'll be the cheer you on as your greatest cheerleader when you're doing well. But more importantly, they're the ones that are going to be willing to have that tough conversation with you when it's needed. You know, like, Hey, um, you're being a real jerk right now. Do you realize that? And that takes courage. And not a lot of people can handle being surrounded by growth minded people. And so it takes agreements. It takes, you know, being there of service, being willing to speak your truth, but speak it with compassion. You know, like if, if you and I were accountability partners, I wouldn't sit there and say, oh my God, mighty P, what the hell are you doing today? You know, you're just being an asshole. He'd be like, you know, hey, um, you got time for a chat because, you know, I want to speak some truth with you. And you deliver it in a way that uplifts you lifts each other and so 
that's what's allowed me to use those two words of what's next and handle things that come my way because I am my own worst enemy. So I step out of my way and allow others to be there to see things I don't see. And together we can accomplish and, and really conquer. I, I'm a huge believer in masterminds. And you know, think of what Napoleon Hill talks about. School, one plus one is e equal to two. But in a mastermind, one plus one is equal to 11. When you bring groups of people together from all different perspectives, you can solve a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. It's very, very true. And for you then, I'm just curious, I mean, do you see a connection between, um, I suppose, su success and connection, if that makes sense, you know, connection to yourself and, and your truth, you know, your truth and success, are they, are they interlinked one and the same? Absolutely, without a doubt. Uh, people go, well, Robert, you know, you travel around the world, you know, I want to do what you do. And then I'm like, well, then you got to be willing to do what I do. I do, even though I, world, I'm still a student as much as I can be. And the student that I'm the most of is learning about myself, being willing to be, you know, do that deep dive into who I am. And um, I'll tell you from being, growing up, being a very close-minded person, who I am today, <laughs> what is possible, that there's things I believe today that if you would have said 20, 25 years ago, hey, Robert, this is the way things are. I'd be like, yeah, no, that's stupid. You know, no, no, this, you know, it, you know I, I'm a big believer in different ways of spirituality, as an example, but I used to be so close minded to it. But today, because of what I've experienced, so I'm always doing a check in with who am I? What is it that I really believe in? Where am I doing well? But where can I maybe take one more step further and improve myself? Because the moment I think I know everything, I know I'm done. And I've been in times that three and a half years I took off, I went into a deep spiral because. I quit learning. I was so burnt out. I forgot to take care of me and I started going backwards. And it wasn't until I started saying, Hey, no, no, no time to get back in and, and really who is Robert? What's working? What's not working? These are three questions that I do all the time with myself and the team. What's working? What's not working? What can be done different? And it's done with no emotion. It's not to beat myself up. It's not to, you know, say, Hey, you did this great, but Oh my God, you sucked there. It's just about what's working, what's not working, what can we do different? And that's how we keep improving myself and the people I'm around. And do you think, you know, today, are you, are you where you're supposed to be today? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, Robert, uh, you, know, you went from traveling around the world and now you're doing things on Zoom. Yep, the world changes. So I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. I've had a few people, they ask that question of, if I could go back to 18 year old Robert and give him some advice, what would it be? And I had to think long and hard on that one, Pete, because I struggled with it. And the conclusion I came up to is I would just either say nothing to him or I'd say, just keep being you because everything I've gone through has made me who I am today. So how can I say, you know, it, it, and I've gone through some dark times, but I look back and I go, what were the lessons I learned? And that's some of our greatest lessons come from some of our hardest times. So yeah, I'm exactly where I'm meant to be. There's that great saying, which I particularly love, you know, it's, you know, from your darkest moment comes your brightest, you know, your brightest ideas yeah. or your brightest, you know, <laughs> well, the greatest gifts you can give the world. Hmm. Some of the greatest, look at some of the people that moved the world is because they went through a dark time and they said never again. Or if I got through this, who can't and who can I help get through it with less pain? So, yeah, absolutely. Do you think everyone gets you, Raymond or Robert? Sorry, keep calling you Raymond. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. No, absolutely not. Mm. And thank God there's over 8 billion people on this planet. <laughs> now, no, you know, I, I can, I've been in front of audiences anywhere from 100 to 6,000, and I might start a training with, uh, say, a thousand people in it and three days later i may be down to 700 people it's i'm not right for everybody mm. and that's okay mm. when you're training out of interest do you do you see the potential in people or is it a feeling mm -hmm. do you see it because i mean quite a lot of your language is quite visual you know just as you yeah. speak 
Um, yeah. And I was curious about that, you know, and then when you're speaking, you know, because speaking is obviously a talent and a, and a skill and a superpower that you have. But yet the, the language is verbal or visual, sorry, in the way that you interpret. So I'm just curious to know how you do you feel the crowd? Do you feel the audience clients? How does it work for you? Do you know? Well, for me, um, one of my passions, as an example, is I love to draw out of people what their message is. I love training trainers. And especially when I mentor people, it's about not so much what their message is itself, but how do I allow them to be more authentic and connected with their audience? Because what I see in so many trainers is they're up here, they're up in their head and they're stuck. And the moment you're thinking about it, you're not connected. And so if you're not connected with your audience, you're not aware of what's going on. And you've probably seen this, Pete, where you've seen someone speaking and they're so disconnected from their audience, they don't even realize something's going on in the audience, but they're so in their head of this is the way my speech goes, I will just keep going. And they don't, they're not even aware they're losing the audience. And so when you can be connected, so when I'm on stage, my number one goal is how can I be of service to the audience? And how do I be the most present? And in, in the training industry, there's something called as ising. You've got to be willing to call it as it is. And so I've had some different things happen in my trainings over the year. And so if I'm not present, I miss it. And so a lot of times people have known me, they say, Robert, how is it you can, and I'll use the word process people. Someone will stand up and they're sharing with the audience. And I'll sit there and I'll ask them a question. I'll say, are you open to playing? And then I have to kind of, the first time I say it, I'll, I'll kind of set a context of what that means. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but have you ever had something come up where all of a sudden you're like, you're talking to someone and something comes up and you're like, oh, I, I need to say that to them. But then your mind goes, but can they handle it? Hmm. And then maybe you edit your thinking of what you're going to say. Has that ever happened to you before? All the time. Right. And, and sometimes when we edit our thinking and we say something different, cause we want to make sure they can handle it. Have you ever noticed sometimes that pisses the person off more than if you would have just said it <laughs> the way it came through. Right. Absolutely. So, so when, for me, I learned a long time ago that when I'm truly present, sometimes something come up, hmm. whether you call it channeling, whether you call it being connected directly to God, to higher power, whatever you go by, something will come up. And I've learned that if something comes up to me, I don't question it. I just, I'm going to say it, but first I'm going to ask the student for their permission to say it. And what I'll tell them is I'll say, I'll ask you if you want to play, if you do, and you want me to continue say yes. And I'm just going to say it as it came out, but if you don't say no, and it goes no further. So in that sense, yes, I see potential in people that they don't see in themselves, but I will tell you, it's not like I'm this all knowing, Oh, you know, guru that sees everybody's potential. I, I don't, there's a lot of people I don't see when they're in front of me. And maybe years later, I do see them. And, and I can give you an example of what I'm saying. If you're open to the example, Please, yeah. okay. there, um, you, one of the things I love and I love to teach people is that when you're truly living your greatness, you may think, you know, who you're impacting, but you may never know. And the cool thing is you don't have to know. You don't have to know when you're living your passion, when you've got that fire in the belly and you're just going and doing what you love It's the people that you don't even realize you're impacting that can have some of the greatest joys. So in 2008, before I took my break, I had, um, you know, been in Malaysia for the first time. We had just launched in 2007 from North America to doing trainings in Singapore and Malaysia. And then I took my break. And during my break, I had a friends in my home city in Alberta, where I live in Canada, saying, hey, we've got this amazing event and we need you to host it. Now, I, this was before my first back surgery. Now, I'm laid up in bed at this time when they're asking me, I've already been laid up in bed for four weeks. I can't move. And you talk about humbling. When someone's got to actually wipe your ass because you can't, that's humbling, Pete. And you learn to let go of the ego. Oh my goodness, <laughs> right? And they're like, Robert, we need you to host. And I'm like, guys, I, I'm waiting for a surgery. There's no way I can do this. Uh, but I'm curious. I'm a curious person. And, and Pete, are you a curious person? Oh, that's, that's the, uh, my whole value system, I think, is based on curiosity. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So I, 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 whether you call it a mistake or not, I'm not going to call it a mistake. I asked a question. You know, why do you need me to host? Who do you happen to have? And they're like, well, Robert, we've got the most amazing lineup. We've actually got the Dalai Lama coming. Who? Who else? 
Well, we've got Sir Richard Branson. We've got F.W. de Klerk. And for those who do not know who F.W. de Klerk is, he was a president of South Africa that set Mandela free. And they're like, we've got Stephen Covey Sr., Les Brown, Barbara DeAngelis. And they listed off all these people. And I don't know about you, but I'm a big believer in manifesting. I ended up manifesting my first surgery that was supposed to be months away to get done early. And all of a sudden, three weeks before the event, I get a surgery, my first surgery. I'm feeling like a million dollars. I'm like, okay, I can host. <laughs> I want to meet these people. And one of the amazing people I had, it was a gentleman by the name of Vishen Lakiani. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Vishen Lakiani. He's the owner of Mind Valley. Amazing, amazing gentleman. Great speaker. Yeah, he got on stage and he blew everybody away. Blew everybody away. And I'm in the green room and I'm talking to him later. One of the side benefits of being a host. And I'm talking to him and I'm like, dude, you are amazing. This was phenomenal. And he's letting me go on for a bit. Then he stops. He goes, Robert, you don't know who I am, do you? I'm like, sure, you're fish and lacking. Yeah, any of your mind value. He goes, no, no. What I mean is, you guys, it's because of you I'm here and how you changed my life. You have no clue, do you? And I'm like, okay, clarify. He says, well, last year in May of 2008, you came to Malaysia and you did a three-day event with 4,800 students. He said, my company was losing $15,000 a month US. I had 15 staff members. We were struggling. I brought nine of my staff members to that weekend. On the first day, we were going to leave because it's like, oh, you're just trying to sell us something. He said, but your energy kept me there. By the end of the weekend, you changed my life. He said, that was in May. By December that same year, so just like seven months ago, eight months ago, he said, we had our first million dollar month, made so much money. We paid off all our debts, bought our office space in our tower in Malaysia. And the company's what it is today. And it's because you changed my life and you actually have no idea. And I was just like, I was blown away because I didn't have any idea. I was just being me doing what I love. And someone in the audience grabbed hold of it and made a change. And so I see the potential in lots of people, but I think some of the most powerful is the people I don't even realize that I'm igniting their potential. It's not some of the most powerful and, and humbling versions of success that mm. you set a ripple off in the universe and yeah. maybe maybe you get to see it maybe you don't and, and neither is both both is okay yes and and i don't want to do a ripple i want to do a freaking tsunami throughout the universe <laughs> you know, that's just my passion it, passion is my favorite word in the whole world and it started off it, look here's how my dream started when i wanted to become a trainer i said if i could even help one person do what my wife and i had been able to do see we had been deep in debt. We were over $150,000 in personal debt, stressed out beyond belief. We ended up out of necessity going to a three-day training that said it could change our life. And we learned about why we were in debt. More importantly, we learned to take ownership that we were the ones that created the debt, quit blaming other people. And then we learned specific action skills of how we could take and get ourselves out of debt. And by applying what we had learned, we'd gone from over $150,000 in debt to being retired completely financially free nine months later when we were 32 and all of a sudden it went that worked and all of a sudden we dived into more learning and that's where i found my passion was to be a trainer and it all started pete with if i could help one person do it do what we did it make it all worthwhile that's how it started it wasn't like i'm gonna travel the world i'm gonna impact hundreds of thousands of lives oh! it was like if i could help one person and today i've now personally taught over half a million people but if you would have told me 20 years ago that this is where I'd be at today, I would have told you you were nuts because I couldn't see it. But I took that first step. And that's to me is the biggest thing that stops most people and why they get overwhelmed is because they're so far ahead trying to figure it all out that they forget to come back to the present and say, what's one step I can do right now in the direction I want to go and become present in that. Because that's why success does come one step at a time. Hey, I mean, I've heard funny recently, I've had a run of people, you know, and the, you get overnight success, but then it's, it's a boom bust, right? So you get a, this massive boom, big success, big exposure, and then 
you know, it's almost like they haven't, the, the core values of them haven't actually changed. Do you see that often people get, you know, and it's, you see, sometimes was you get, you get an inspirational trigger, a motivational trigger, and there's get this blip of energy, but it's not transformational. It's not long-term. So, right. You know, how would you direct somebody that actually maybe is experiencing that, or maybe doesn't feel they deserve what they, they are capable of? Well, this is where the um, self inner learning and looking comes into play. Because if you look at everything in the universe, it's energy. It travels in frequencies and vibrations. It's gonna have ups and downs. Uh, in the training arena, I tell all my new trainers that you're going to go through something I call the star struck stage. And I don't care who you are. It's not the fact that you're not gonna go through it. You're gonna go through it. The question is how quickly can you get through it? And this is where having yourself surrounded by amazing people that will keep you grounded. This is where introspection, who am I? Why am I really doing this? Constantly checking in with yourself. That's what's going to help a person get through it. Because yes, you know, one of the, I talk about something called four currencies of life. And one of the currencies is the currency of fame. And you've seen, everybody's seen around the world how fame ruins lives. And so why is it some people can handle it and some people can't? Well, it's, it's who they are at the core that's going to determine that in my belief is that it's the person who, how much work do they do on themselves? Do they think they're just now ego driven? Like I'm awesome. Everybody loves me and, and I'm, I'm God. Or do they go, I can stay humble through this because you know, it can be fame can be very fleeting. And so am I just going to be known as that person that, you know, was a one hit wonder or do I want to go long-term with it? And I remember seeing an interview years ago with Jennifer Lopez that really resonated it with me. And the person interviewing her said, you know, here you are, you're this powerhouse. You're a singer, an actress, a businesswoman. You're an absolute powerhouse. But Jennifer, you're also an amazing mother. Your family you, is so important to you and you're a powerhouse there as well. How do you keep those two separate? You've been in the industry for so long and still thriving. How do you keep it separate? And her response was basically, well, I'm just me, but when I'm in front of the camera, I'm JLo. That's who I am. That's my persona. But when I'm at home, I'm Jennifer Lopez to my family. And I was like, damn. See, when I'm traveling around the world and I've got people taking care of me and I'm in front of thousands of students, I'm Robert Raymond Riopel. I'm me, but that's my persona. But when I'm home, I'm just Robert or Rob. And uh, you know, another kind of, grounding joke that my wife and I have I'll come home from overseas just done a couple of weeks I've you know people taking care of everything for me I'll step come in the house and she'll go honey you're home no more assistance go take out the garbage and I love it because it keeps me grounded mm -hmm. and you know imagine like I love camping and I don't know if you do um Pete but I love camping next week my wife and I are going to be out for a week with family we just put our RVs in a circle we have a big fire pit in the middle and we just connect with each other. Can you imagine if I'm sitting around the campfire and going, don't you guys know I'm Robert? Someone go get my beer. By the way, who's making dinner? Yeah, I ain't gonna last very long. My siblings are gonna kick the crap out of me if I try <laughs> to be that jerk, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, it all comes down to is, you know, who can you be with the fame and when times are good and when times aren't good? Can you be the same person? Can you be you? Can you be authentic? Or do you think you have to be someone else? When when did you get into the the fullest and most true version of yourself, if that makes sense to you? Hmm. I think it's constantly happening. I don't know if there'd be the time where it was the truest because there's moments all the time where I'm my truest self. And then there's moments where I slip back into being that people pleaser that I grew up being. So that one, I'd say it's kind of like a same thing. It's the up and the down, it's the energy. Mm. So I, my practice is to be my truest self as many moments as I can. And to really practice being that. And it's a conscious practice because self doubt is one of the things I still fight with. And being that people pleaser is still something I fight with. But instead of 
fighting with it and, and beating myself over being that, I'm aware of it. And I, I observe it and it's like, hmm, interesting. And so if I notice that I'm hitting tough times, I'll look back and go, okay, who's coming into play? People pleaser, self doubt. What's, which one of those, you know, other Roberts is coming into play try, to try and hold me back. So I don't know if that actually answers the question, but that's kind of the way I look at it. Mm, that's very interesting. And, and for you then, uh, talk to me about ego, either your ego or the, the presence of ego in general. Everybody has it. And the people that try to say they don't are the ones that usually struggle with it. And what I've realized over the years is that if you understand that you have ego, if you don't want it to sabotage you, then what I've done is I've had to learn how to give it a space to play in a healthy way. And here's what I mean by that. Most people that I've observed they, that they're like, I don't have ego. Well, because they try to deny it and they suppress it, it comes out in the weird ways in the most unopportune times. And so when I'm on stage, as an example, for me, and this is my belief, just my belief, there's no room for ego, absolutely no room. So if I know if I don't want my ego coming out on stage because I have ego, then how do I allow it to safely come out so it doesn't surface there? And what I've learned over the years for me, video games. I like my video games. And I'll tell you, Pete, if you and I are playing head-to-head -head in a video game or any kind of competition, you're going down because this is where I allow my ego to fully play in a safe way. And so that when I'm doing like trainings, I can be very present and no ego. And I'm not worried about it coming up. Now, that being said, there's times where I've allowed my ego to come out on stage, but in a controlled manner. And an example of that is, you know, because I've been, I've been blessed to train thousands of trainers around the world. I remember one time, I believe I was in Orlando, Florida, I was teaching a five day program on how to do experiential trainings like I do. And I had an audience about um, 300 people. And what people don't know about success is it's, it takes work. It's not easy. You've got to put the work in and you've got to learn the basics. You can't just sit there and say, I, I just want the easy stuff that give me all the glory. It's like, what are you doing behind the scenes? And the first day and a half of this training is very monotonous, very basic. And a lot of people are like, oh, really? And I remember I'm doing the training and all of a sudden, day and a half in, this guy gets up in the audience and he stands up and he goes, I'm leaving, I'm out of here. And he starts walking out of the room. And so, you know, as is in coming back to that, I could have just kept doing the training, but I stopped and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, can you give us some feedback? What's going on? He, he looks at us and he goes, this is just too basic. I don't need this shit. I'm already doing a million dollars a year in, in my training business. And in that moment, I snapped into ego and I looked at him and I said, then sit your ass down because I'm doing 15 to 20 million a year. So obviously there's something you don't know. And he looked at me, he came back, he sat down. I said, ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause for speaking his truth. Cause you don't sit there and, and you know, he, that in the moment, that was the truth. At the end of the training, all of a sudden he comes up to me and he's like, wow, thank you for having me sit down. He said, now I know what has been holding me back all these years where I couldn't seem to get over a million dollars a year in, in revenue in my business, in my training business. He says, I can't wait to go back. And today he does seven figures, eight figures consistently every year because there was one little thing that he was missing. And had I let him walk out of the room, he probably would have stayed stuck. So ego is a funny little thing. But don't try and pretend you don't have it. Just learn to find a way to allow it to come out in a healthy way. I love that, that sort of exercising of all parts of you, you know, and it's rather than saying it doesn't exist or no, no, no that's, we got rid of that ego thing a while ago, you know, and um, sent it packing. It, it's actually giving it a time and a space to vent. Yeah. Um, and, but recognizing the different parts of you and recognizing it's there to serve in some shape or form. You know, it's not bad, it's not good, it just is. It just, and that's exactly it. It just is. It's the same thing as I know I'm a procrastinator. I absolutely know that. And I used to beat myself up over that. But now one of my favorite sayings I came up with is, I design my day in such a way that procrastination cannot play. And so because I know I keep my commitments to people, I on purpose 
will schedule trainings, interviews, calls, meetings for first thing in the morning. Why? Because I know I have to get up. The moment I'm up, I'm good to go. But if I have nothing scheduled, like Sundays are one of my down days. So this past Sunday, I slept until noon because I had nothing on the schedule and I live by my schedule today. And you know, there's a whole number of reasons why, but Sundays are our days off. So my wife, she got up, she was doing stuff. She let me sleep because she knew I needed it. And I gave myself permission to have it. So I don't sit there and beat myself up for what people might think are shortfalls. It's like, nope, that's part of me. So either I can resist it and fight it, or I can embrace it and say, how do I utilize it and work it within my day-to-day -day schedule and embrace it? I mean, how do you get the best out of yourself? I mean, you're saying they're having a structure and things like that, but where, where is, where's your places of creativity, your places of flow, connection? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I have what I call the four phases of life. And I, I can go through those and that'll kind of explain it right there if, if you're up for that. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank right? you. And, and I've been, I am all, I'm a big believer, Pete, in giving credit where credit's due. The information, what I call my four phases of life, I didn't originally create it. A friend of mine did, and he called it his chaos modules. And, and this gentleman, like, you talk about absolute brilliance. Years ago, I gave him a nickname. I called him the quantum monk because he was not only a monk for eight years that did over 15,000 hours of meditation, but he also studies quantum physics. So he can tell you all about spirituality and back it up with the science behind it. The guy is brilliant. And during his 15,000 hours of meditation and research, he came up with this theory called his chaos modules. And when I heard it for the first time, it blew me away. And I'm like, Greg, you need to get this out to the world, but it's not his passion. It's something he came across and he, it tweaked his interest and he studied it. And, and, and I said, so can I get it out to the world? And he's like, absolutely. I'd, I'd be honored if you did. So he spent a number of hours on zoom for me to dive deeper and deeper. And you've heard the saying, the student becomes the master by the time we we're done. He's just like, man, you've taken this deeper than I thought it would go. And he's, he loved kind of the insight I put into it. Cause I put it into my own words. And so I use acronyms. I love acronyms. They help me remember. I'll joke around with people. I say, I have one brain cell left. I'm doing everything I can to take care of that brain cell. And some people will go, Robert, why are you putting yourself down? And I said, no, no, you may think that's what it is. But for me, it's a reminder that I'm still learning, that I don't know everything. Right? And I like to keep things simple. And so I use the acronym of OPEN. And the O, the first phase is called the observation phase. This is the creation phase. This is where you meditate. This is where vision boards come in. When you're in this phase, this is where you ask yourself, what would I love to have? What would I love to do? Who would I absolutely love to be? Now, in this phase, um, Pete, it's not about trying to figure it out. What's it going to look like? Where, when's it going to happen? No, this is just the creation phase. And this is the time where you just dream and believe what's possible. That's all you do in this time. Because then the next phase, the P stands for the pamper phase. And what's interesting, especially for entrepreneurs, this is the phase, and I'm coming from experience of my life. This is the phase that most entrepreneurs believe that they have time or they don't believe that it's valuable. They don't believe they deserve it. The pamper phase is taking care of you. This is the time that you either schedule or go on a vacation. This is the time that you maybe, if you have hair, get a haircut. Otherwise, you don't. Or manicure, pedicure, massage. Um, this is the time that maybe you take 15 minutes and you go and just quiet your mind. You go for a walk, read a book. This is the time to take care of you. And the reason I really dive into this one is because, look, I experienced this one for four and a half years. I overlived my passion. I forgot to take care of me. I was giving so much to so many people. Four and a half years, over 200 multi-day trainings, two days a month on, a, a, on average at home. That's it. I forgot to take care of me. That's why I got burnt out. That's why I herniated the disc and went through the back surgeries. So in the pamper phase, you cannot give what you don't have. And you have to be willing to be selfish about this. So one of the things, you know, going back to the calendar as an example, today, my wife and I live by the calendars on our phone. And the first thing that we put on our calendars before anything else, see, and when you talk money, have you heard of wealth rule number one, 
which is pay yourself first. Have you heard of that rule, Pete? Yeah, it's a great rule. It is. So the question is, is if you're doing that for yourself for money, why wouldn't you do that for yourself for time? Mm-hmm. So the first thing my wife and I put on our calendar is our balance pieces, time for each other, time for ourselves, family, our health. Those go on first in our calendar before anything else is laid down so that we know that we can, we're taking care of ourselves. So the moment we decide we're going camping, we put that on the calendar first and nothing else gets scheduled in that week that we're camping. Why? Because that's our time. If we don't take time for ourselves, then that's when things go south. And in the pamper phase, and this is, you know, it's kind of, I'm going to give you a little inside secret why I like doing long flights. Because people go, Robert, you know, you were flying on average 200,000 miles a year. Why are you willing to get on a 10 hour, 12 hour, 16 hour flight? Well, number one, I love meeting people all over the world and impacting lives. But two, the selfish reason is the moment I get on a plane and sit in my seat, that's my time. I don't do business. I don't connect to Wi-Fi. I read because I love to read. I watch movies because I love movies. I get some sleep, eat some good food, drink some great wine. That's Robert's time. Because I know the moment I step off the plane for the next three to five days, I'm on stage for up to 12 hours a day, giving, giving, giving. So I don't, if I don't take care of me, how can I truly give the best I have? So pamper time is critical, critical. So when you go from the observation phase and you'll flow into the pamper phase, the next phase, the E stands for the energy phase. And this is the get it done phase. And now if, if you're doing the pamper phase properly, like you and I were discussing before you hit record, today for me is an absolute energy day. I'm up at um, 4.45. I'll wrap up my final teaching because I'm start finishing with power mentoring calls with students. I'll finish about 8, 8.30 p.m. So that means that's a 12, 16, 17-hour day for me. Now, I'm going to be tired when I'm done, but am I going to be wiped out? No. See, because I've been taking care of the pamper side. So when it comes to getting the energy phase done and an energy day, I can breeze through this and be energized and be passionate all the way through, even if I'm tired because I've taken care of myself. So that's the energy phase. And then the fourth phase, and you, you have to bear with me and, and I am going to apologize. The N is not the first letter of the fourth phase. I had to get creative on this one because I knew I wanted to use the word um, open as my acronym. So I just couldn't come up with a word at the time. And the end is part of unclutter. It's the second letter of the word. This is another word for chaos. And Pete, have you ever noticed that sometimes things can be going great? And all of a sudden, it's like the universe or the world throws you a curveball and chaos comes in your life. Have you ever had that happen? All the time, yeah. People, reason this one is so important is because when chaos happens in people's life, most people get upset and resist it. They don't realize chaos is natural. You see, as human beings, we're meant to evolve. And it's when we get stuck in that comfort zone, that chaos will come in to get us unstuck. And if you think about it, you look back at your life, you may have had chaos come in and give you a lesson. And if you ignored it, what did it do? It came back again, even harder the next time. True? Mm -hmm. And so what people have to understand is if you embrace chaos and you could actually courageously, courageously volunteer to work with and embrace chaos, you could actually have a much greater life because when you're in the um, chaos phase or the unclutter phase, and I'll tell you why I call it unclutter in a moment, this is the time to destroy something. This is the time to let go of things that are not working in your life. So maybe it might be time to end a personal or business relationship that hasn't been working and it does take courage. This is the time to maybe um, let go of a negative non-supportive belief that you've held on to for years. You don't know why, and it's not serving you, but this is the time to destroy that belief by proving it wrong. Proof is the greatest cure of all doubt. And the reason I call it unclutter is because the way you can volunteer with chaos is you can actually, have you ever gone to your refrigerator, opened it up and you're like, whew, there's something a little old in there. Maybe I need to clean that out, right? You can actually unclutter. Most people hang on to stuff so tightly 
but I'll come into my office every couple of weeks and I'll straighten it out and I'll get rid of the things I don't need anymore. The paperwork that's done, the yeah, I'll unclutter. You can go to your closet and unclutter. And by being willing to volunteer, all of a sudden the chaos doesn't come as hard into your life. And what my friend Greg says, I love something he said. He said this, he said, it's not about living life. It's about courageously being willing to allow life to live you. You see, because if you embrace chaos and you come through that unclutter phase, it actually opens you up because you've evolved back into the observation phase, which means even more is possible for you. And you can actually dream even bigger of what would I truly like to have? And the phases you go through them, A, I want people to understand, you don't have control of when you're gonna go in and out of a phase, you have no control, or how long you're gonna be there. But if you understand the phases and you can identify them, then it allows you to actually have that journey more fluidly instead of getting stuck in chaos or like, why me? And your personal relationship can be in one phase, whereas your business can be in another. So we have these phases in all different parts of our life. So business-wise, I'm in an energy phase right now. I totally get that. So that's why I know today is a productive day. See, and that's one thing about energy too is, as you probably hear a lot of people, Pete, that go, you know, I want more success in my life, but I'm so busy. I've got a family. I've got my business. I've got my job. I can't take on anymore. And what I've learned, especially in the energy phase, there's a difference between being busy and being productive. Two totally different worlds. And most people have become really, really good at being busy but they're not necessarily productive. And so, you know, as an example of that, I could sit there, I'm writing my new book right now, The Authority Key, and I could sit there and go, okay, I'm going to go to my office. I'm going to write my book. Eight hours later, I come out of my office. I'm like, man, was I busy. But it doesn't look like I really got a lot done on the book. What was I doing for the last eight hours? And if I look back, I'm like, oh, I was on social media a lot. I was texting, instant messaging. I was reading emails and responding. Oh, and I wrote a little bit of the book as well. So I was busy, but I wasn't productive. So the second thing I put on my calendar, the balance pieces go on first. The second thing that gets entered in my calendar is what is called focus time. And research has shown that if to truly stay focused, a person can't really stay focused on something for more than an hour before they start getting distracted. So I'll block out little like hour focus time spots. And if I want to write, I might put, okay, 10 to 11 writing book. And in that hour, I do nothing else, no other distractions, but I get to work writing my book. And in that hour of being productive, I is equivalent to about six hours of being busy. So when people understand how to be productive and it is a habit, it takes work. They can actually free up so much time in their life that they didn't realize that they had because they've now become productive versus being busy. So those are the four phases that people are constantly going through. How much do you think for people is it's, you know, void based, whether it be, you know, the way they keep themselves busy, the way their definition of success, their, you know, what they're doing, it's, you know, cause I'm always intrigued by a saying, you know, it's like your voids can be your values. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing, potentially. Um, clarify voids. Um, so I'm just, yeah. Well, I suppose for some, it may be, you know, growing up, it may be you had no money. So when you get older, you say, my definition of success is to have money mm. until you mm. get it. And then you go, what do I do now? <laughs> this is yeah. something I've been chasing my life, but I don't really know what to do when I get it. Do you know, does that make sense? Totally. Now, yeah, and, and absolutely. Because, um, and because I do a lot of work on who people are today based on what they heard, saw, and experienced growing up, mm. I totally get that. And you're right. Because when it comes to money, as an example, people will either be exactly like one or both of their parents in the arena of money, or they'll be the opposite because of the void. And, uh, you know, yeah, I grew up in a poor family, so I'm going to be rich. And then you work so hard at being rich but then your family life pays the price. And this again is where, so to me, a void can work as long as you approach it in a healthy way. And, and again, this is where that 
inner introspection comes in. So um, both my wife and I grew up in families where the youngest, of, I'm the youngest of four, she's the youngest of five. Financially, our families struggled all their time. My parents, just to keep the family fed, they were always moving to keep working so that they could provide. Now, they were so good at always making things work, we never went without, but we didn't realize that how poor we were because we never felt poor because my parents had that way of taking care of us. And it was instilled in us, if we wanted something ourselves, we had to go out and earn the money and get it. So I've been an entrepreneur since I was young. And you know, I look back today and, and you want to talk about scary. Picture this, at 11 years old, my summer job on during summer school vacation, five days a week, I was actually for eight hours a day, babysitting three kids, five days a week, 40 hours a week. And one of them was a toddler, a baby in diapers. And I was changing diapers. I had to have lunch, um, make lunch for him. I also had to have dinner ready for when the parents came home. And I was 11. Who in their right mind <laughs> as an 11 year old take care of three kids? But that was a different time back then, right? Because I wanted to earn money. And it was friends of my parents. And they're like, you know, they need to both work. So Robert can babysit. And I made like $40 a week to do that. I was making an hour a day or an hour, a dollar an hour. But I was, you know, it helped me. I learned working hard, stuff like that. And I knew, so that void, but yes, in the beginning, I was, I wanted money, 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 money. What can we do to earn money? And no wonder I got burnt out. No wonder um, I struggled with it until I started learning what's the balance within it. So yeah, I think voids can empower you and ignite the fire in your belly but make sure you know who you are on that journey so that you can not just overdo it. Uh, are you good at sort of ref self-reflecting sort of knowing who you are and also sense checking it, that you're not stuck in your own sort of truth chamber, you know, your own echo chamber, which your version of the truth may or may not be anyone else's version of the truth. Right. That's again, why it comes back to the people you surround yourself with. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, look, my wife, one of the gifts she gives me is not to let me play smaller than I am. Even when she has to kick me in the butt and say, step up. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I, it's an, always a practice interflecting and, and who, who am I? But it's also having those people around you. So it's a bit of both because you're right. If it was just me, my truth could be, well, this is the way it is. That's what I believe. But it, it, having that outside view point makes a big difference for sure. What is your superpower? Helping people tap into their passions. My mission is to guide and assist individuals in not only identifying, but living their purpose with passion. And I'm good at that. What's the nicest thing somebody could say to you? It may sound interesting, but the greatest compliment nowadays is when someone calls me their guru. And I'd love to clarify that because I hated that word. But now it's one of the greatest compliments in the world I can receive. Why did you hate it out of interest? Because you know, to me, I'm no different than anybody else. Hmm. And we put each other and other people on pedestals. I know I used to. I used to put people on pedestals so high that there's no way they could live up to the perception I had of them. And so... When I started doing trainings and people would call me the guru, I didn't like that because I'm like, I'm not any different. And I was in, um, I was doing a training where I was doing a five day training, very powerful. This training we would do, you start at 6 a.m. in the morning, you finish about 1 a.m. in the morning for five days straight. It's a very intensive training. And while I was teaching that training and we were in a camp setting, I was also teaching six trainers how to train that training. So I, you know, was going even longer days. And one of my friends, a very dear friend, and remind me at the end, um, because I think he would be killer for you to interview. I just finally got him onto the, where we met on Podmatch. The man is amazing. And I had him come in while the students were doing something else. I had him sit down with my six trainers to give them some um, extra deep instructions on it from his superpower of just who he is. And he was talking to one of the people and they're in that. So picture this, he's sitting here and he's got the six trainers in front of him. I'm off to the side. 
And one of his superpowers is he reads people, facial, body language, all that. And he's talking to the person and, and the, the trainer, his name is Tom, goes, yeah, Robert's my guru. And I didn't even realize I, a subtle flinch. And all of a sudden Aaron stops and he goes, hang on, Tom. He says, Robert, what just happened? I'm like, nothing, nothing, Aaron. Just keep going, keep going. He goes, no, no, no. Why did you just flinch? I'm like, Aaron, it's about them. He says, you're right. And they're learning from you. So until you fess up of what just happened, I'm not continuing. And I knew I'm, I'm not going to get them to go off the subject. So I'm like, fine. I said, I don't like that word guru. He says, why? I said, because I'm just me. He says, exactly. Okay, I get it. He says, Robert, do me a favor. And I'm going to have you do this for me, Pete. He says, spell the word guru. So go ahead and spell that word for me. G-U-R-U. Yep. I said, G-U-R-U. And he looked at me, G-U-R-U. <laughs> <laughs> and in that instant, it became the greatest compliment someone could give me is because I, that's what I strive to be is just be me. And so when someone now, um, you know, again, it comes to that authenticity. I love to teach trainers and it, that comes, you go back to the pain and pleasure part that comes from a pain, just like all industries. It's amazing in the training industry, who you see on the stage some of the top thought leaders in the world, the moment they step off the stage, they change into a different person. And that drives me absolutely bonkers, bonkers. Because, so it keeps me on track to be, you know, a mentor had said it to me, one of my greatest lessons, he said, Robert, you can never be afraid to meet a student somewhere in the world and have to figure out who to be. Just be you all the time, on stage and off stage. And then you never have to worry. And I love that because I've met students in, the most um, unique places around the world. And some, and it's uh, shocking uh, or fun when they're like, wow, in real life, you still have the same bad jokes and you're just as quirky as you are on stage. I'm like, yeah, this is me, right? And so that's really kind of why that's the greatest compliment that could come to me is someone called me their guru. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a lovely way of looking at it. Lovely. Mm. What was a particularly high moment for you and then also a particularly low moment? So many high moments, <laughs> so many low moments. <laughs> um, a high moment would be June 3rd, 1989. The moment my wife and her um, stepdad came around the corner to come down the aisle and marry me. I, that picture is so vivid in my mind, just how amazingly stunning it just took my breath away. So that would be a huge high moment for me. Was that your wife or your father-in-law? Well, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Someone with the same warm sense of humor I have, I would ask probably the same question. <laughs> yeah, the bride was all right. The father-in-law was looking spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's good. Um, a low moment would be, um, well, remember I was referring to the event I hosted with the Dalai Lama. Mm. Um, I hadn't listened to the doctor, didn't take care of myself. I'm three weeks out of my surgery and I went to the event and I said, I'm going to do this event. And I thought to take care of myself as soon as I'd be off stage, I'd sit down, not realizing that I was putting more pressure on my lower back than if I was standing. And two days after the event, I woke up and, and standing straight again was a crooked curve. And I'm like, uh Oh, something's going wrong. And I said, I'm going to go to the chiropractor. My wife said, no, that's not a good idea. You only had the surgery three weeks ago and I'm in severe pain. I'm like, I got to do something. And I went to the chiropractor and he looked at me and he's talking. He's like, no, there's no way I should be doing any adjustments to you because you just had surgery three weeks ago. Um, but I can be a pretty convincing guy, Pete. I can. He, and after talking to him a bit more, he goes, tell you what, I'll just do a table drop. That's where we, they raise the table. They don't actually press on you. They just hold your back while you, the table goes down an inch to do a slight adjustment. Um, he did that twice. I couldn't get up off the, his table. I said, you better call my wife. He, they put ice on my back, um, called my wife, took her about 15 minutes to get there. She came in like a storm, I got to tell you. And she looked at him and she said, you know, what's going on? 
She tried to help me get up. I couldn't get up. She turned around and said, you call the ambulance. And next thing you know, I'm being wheeled out past all those patients, not good advertising <laughs> by the ambulance. And I spent three weeks in the hospital because I had re-herniated the same disc being, you know, stupid. And uh, the next three weeks waiting for the inflammation to go down enough that they could redo the surgery. And uh, I felt sorry. I, I, they put me in a semi-private room in the heart ward, people waiting for, you know, heart trans or uh, like um, heart bypass surgeries and stuff. And I went through six roommates in that three weeks. And I felt sorry for every single one of them because I couldn't sleep. And, and like the moment I start to sleep three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, my body would seize up and I'd wake up screaming in pain. And I, so I put them through hell uh, during that three weeks before they could redo the surgery. And I ended up redoing the surgery. And I woke up from that second surgery and I looked at the doctor and my wife and I said, I'm never going through that again. I said to the doctor, whatever you tell me to do, I'll listen to you second. I looked at my wife. I said, whatever you tell me to do, I'm listening to you first. <laughs> because yeah, that was a really low time going through that. Isn't it amazing actually that it's actually understanding what's the best, best for you as opposed to the external version versus the internal version, right? You know, so listening to your body, listening to those around you that know you versus yeah. what you, what you want. Yep, absolutely. Mm. You know, and that's, that's again, why it comes so powerful to have, you know, you, you hear the saying, and it's so cliche that your um, network is reflective of your net worth. Mm. But it is so true. It's who are you surrounding yourself with? You know, um, Aaron, who again, I'm telling you, you don't want to have him as a guest. One of our agreements together is that if we're having a particularly something's gone wrong in our life and we just need to vent and let it out, we know we can get a hold of the other person and that person will make time and their sole purpose is just to be the sounding board to let the other just get out, scream, yell, cuss, whatever, get the energy out, not take it personally, but just be there to be a sounding board. And just to say at the end, are you complete? And if you're not, you keep going. If you are, you say, yeah, great. Thank you. No judgment around it. No, nothing. No trying to fix it. No, nothing. Just being a sounding board. See, to have people like that in your life, because we all go through shit. We all do. But when we try to do it on our own, no wonder we cause illness. No wonder we struggle. No wonder we can't get out of low times. Especially, again, look at the, where the world is today. Who are you connected with? And one of the things I, I encourage anybody and everybody to do is three people a day, just either reach out to them by a phone call or even a message with three simple words. How are you? Because you don't know who you're going to send a message to that needs that right in that moment. And maybe it opens up a conversation where just by you actually genuinely being interested in how they're doing, you don't know how, what impact you can have on their life in that moment. And don't just do it because, oh, Robert said to do it. Okay, how are you? Next, how are you? Next, how are you? Yep, check, did that today. No, actually be interested in how they're doing. Who's your intuition? Clarify. I'm just curious. It's, again, it's a very, it's almost in a very intuitive sense to, to reach out to somebody and say, how are you? Because the question is, why them? You know, if we've 5,000 Facebook friends or whatever, and God knows how many in the phone book and, you know, no matter what's going on, but it's like an almost an intuitive nudge from the universe or something that says, yep. why did that person believe her? Yeah. Big believer. Cause I used to not, not believe that hmm. it used to be, it has to be learned or you know, I have figured out why no, why no. Now it's just like, if it feels right, I follow it. What changed? So I'm a huge believer. Um, me. Um, again, in the box thinker and realizing that that's not the only way. Uh, example, when my wife and I started our journey as students, we were introduced from one of the trainings we did as students, we were introduced to a gentleman that he had two powerful programs. 
at the time, one was called the divine dance, which is basically the dance of the masculine and the feminine. We all have it in us. Every single person has masculine and feminine. And your core is either masculine or your core is feminine. And you can be a male with a feminine core. You can be a female with a masculine core. It's no right or wrong to it. And people cause disease when they're out of their, you know, they're not rooted in what their base one is. And so we were interested in that training because my wife and I, at that time, we were married 13 years and we're like, you know, we had a good marriage, but we knew we wanted to have a deeper marriage. And so we knew we wanted to do that training with a gentleman, but he had another training called the um, Enlightenment Intensive. And the only reason we didn't want to do it is because we found out we could not do it together. And my wife and I do everything together. And he's like, yeah, but the reason you can't is because we go so deep that we don't want you holding something back that you want to release because you're afraid someone else that you know might hear it and it, they might judge. And so we, we didn't, we're like, no, we're not doing it. But when he really, when we saw the depth of his knowledge, when we did the first training with him, then it was a no brainer. The only question was who was going to Vancouver for his next training and who was going to Ontario for his next training. Cause we knew we were going to do the other one. And and it was basically, he started opening up the world of understanding. So as an example, um, my wife and I, because she grew up as the youngest of five, raised by a single mother, her mother taught her children to be strong and she taught her two daughters, you don't rely on a man. So my wife was very much in her masculine, even though her core is feminine. And because she was in her masculine all the, most of the time, it automatically put me into my feminine. So we were both out of core. And when I learned how to gift her into her feminine so that we could do that dance and all of a sudden we saw the changes it was making, that's when I started believing in things that weren't necessarily um, understandable or book learned or, you know, that I started really believing in to my inner intuition and that started a whole journey. And that was back in 2002. That's where the change really happened. And I mean, uh, I think it possibly goes without saying, I mean, where do you sit in regards to spirituality connection versus religion, say, versus just the world that we live in? I'm very spiritual, but I don't necessarily believe in religion. And I look at it, oh, hey, my dad, very heavy Catholic family, second oldest of 10. My mom was one of eight in a Protestant, heavy Protestant family. And when the two of them got married, both families disowned them because they married outside of their religion. And that caused a lot of strife for years within our families. Now, we, our families have come back together over the years and that, but that was a big lesson for me. And, and my parents were, you know, their belief was you'll go to church until you're 10, do Sunday school, at which point you can then make up your own mind whether you want to continue or not. And, and I continued a couple of years later because, you know, okay, this is making sense. But then I, I love to learn all, all arenas. And so I just kind of found myself, there was one time I considered myself to be an atheist because I was like my, my one grandmother, I, I am in this, I'm going to own it that it was my perception, Pete. It wasn't who she was is how I perceived is I'm like, She's just, she, every time I'm with her, she's always trying to push religion down my throat. Robert, you got to be saved and all that. And I resisted. And, and so I just went, I'm atheist. I don't believe in this, blah, blah, blah. But when I again started learning my, about who I am, all of a sudden, and I started realizing I'm a very spiritual person. Also, my grandmother and I had started having some of the deepest conversations I've ever had. Because I now saw her perspective through a different light if that makes sense and all of a sudden and she's like and, and you know the one time we're having this conversation about you know because I was teaching students something as simple as money's not the root of all evil you know the attachment to money is the root of all evil the over attachment and that opened up a conversation she goes and all of a sudden we went through like a two hour we were on a drive two hour conversation that was deeper than any, any we'd ever had and her perspective of it was, it was so in alignment with everything I had believed but because I had been closed-minded to who she was before, I wasn't seeing it. But the moment I became open, I realized, oh, wow, we were saying the same things. 
I just perceived it differently because it was coming from my grandmother who I perceived as a, just a Bible thumper, right? And so it, it, it became a kind of another one of those paradigm shifts. So I'm very, very spiritual. And I love to learn about all different religions because I believe there's a lot of commonalities and there's something you can learn from every single one. I find that fascinating because there was a slight change in tense of, you know, intense there, you know, the I, the my come into play there. Um, you know, but I don't know what, it's just different parts of your life. You, you've been through different versions, right? Mm -hmm. Always journeying, always changing, right? Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Super powerful the way. Yeah. It's, it is that self-reflection. It, it's the ability to see outside of yourself. It's the ability to, to be, go, go further, see. Uh, out of curiosity, I mean, are you, do you think you've been here as a soul or as a, as a body before? <laughs> I do. I, I just have a sense that I, I'm now open to that possibility. Mm. And that's one of, I think that's one of the reasons I make jokes all the time is that when I do leave this planet, I hope to come back as one of my own pets because my wife and I love animals and, and they're pampered like crazy. And I'm like, that's the way I want to come back next time is to be a pampered pet. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Right? Which, which one would you be? <laughs> well, I think, you know, right now, because we happen to have six cats because we now live on an acreage, but I also have a very unique pet who's a princess and she's a 265 pound pet pig. And she doesn't know she's a pig. She thinks she's a dog. So don't tell her, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but she's actually a princess. And we've had her since she was two days old. She was this big when we started bottle feeding her and she's now almost 10. And she is such a personality. She is I, eventually one of our bucket lists. My wife and I are going to write a, a series of children's books based on her. We're going to call it The Adventures of Gracie May because she's taught us so much about life, just interacting with her and stuff. And so as an example, um, it's still early morning here and she, you do not even think of waking her up before noon. Cause if you do, she's a grumpy girl <laughs> and it's just, you know, so yeah, uh, uh, pets are amazing. So come back as any of my amazing pets. Mm. No, it's always fascinating, isn't it? You know, that, and, and do you feel that you're guided by something outside of yourself, something connected to higher oh, power? Yeah, yeah when, when this is one of the reasons to be authentic and be present as much as possible. Because the moment you're present, you're connected to the highest powers out there, whether you call it God, great spirit, mm -hmm. whatever you call it. That's when you are, and that's when I get some of my greatest downloads. Um, from back, I like to walk. That's one of the easiest ways to lose them. And when I'm walking, I become very present. And also some of the greatest um, insights come into play, you know, for what I want to write in my book or, you know, oh, I want to call this person or I have this idea. And I'm a big believer. Um, one of my clues in my book is write it down because I know, have you ever thought of something, Pete, and then like 10 seconds later, like, that was brilliant, but what was it again? And you can't for the life of you remember what it was, right? And people put so much pressure on themselves thinking they're going to remember. So I've got in the habit now, I grab my phone and I'll either voice memo something or I'll write it in the, in the notes section and then I can let it go and keep walking. I don't have to try and figure it out. And because so, that is to me when you're truly um, connected to the greatest powers in the world, in the universe. Mm. I was going to say, what, what is, I mean, do you have set ways of actually of downloading? I mean, are you a journaler? Are you a chatter? Do you, you know, what do you do to, to sort of take it to the next step? Like, Yeah, for me, um, I, I, years ago, I, I did a Zen retreat and um, my mentor had brought his Zen teacher to us. Now picture this, four days of me being absolutely silent. I think it was my wife's greatest time. <laughs> and um, I was, we were, we were all day long doing very like uh, contemplating, eating, con um, eating contemplation, walking contemplation, working contemplation, doing lots of meditating. And at night we could ask questions. And I, there was one question that was bugging me, but I hadn't had the courage to ask it. And this woman actually asked it instead. She said to our Zen teacher, she said, Sherry, while I'm here in this space and this energy, it's easy to meditate and it's so powerful. But when I go home, I've got a family, I got a business. 
I'm not going to have time to sit there for 20 minutes and go home and meditate. And Sherry looked at her and she said, dear, meditating is simply being present. So anything that you're doing in your day where you're actually truly present in that moment, you're meditating. And I went, that's brilliant. So that's where, you know, something we were talking about earlier. One of my practices is how can I be present more of the day? And it's one of the, again, one of the currencies I talk about is um, a currency of experience. Instead of being caught so much in the future, trying to figure things out and all the what if scenarios or being hung up in the past of, well, this happened, that happened. Can I be present right now and experience the moment, the good, the bad, the ugly, no matter what it is. And so as an example of that, Pete, have you ever been having a conversation with someone and you're talking to them and they're, they're physically with you, but you know, mentally, emotionally, their mind's somewhere else. Have you ever experienced that? Yeah, it happens. Yeah. So that's one of my practices. Like right now I'm here with you. I'm aware of everything else that's going on, but I'm here with you. So I'm pa- actually meditating at the same time, mm. which is allowing me to have that connection. And I don't edit it. I just flow with it. So it goes back to the flow as well. Right. And so my day-to-day practices is how much can I meditate throughout the day and celebrate the meditation, even the little, even if it's five seconds, even if it's 20 minutes, how much can I be present? And this is where, when it comes to success, as an example, people think it's about the quantity of time that they're going to spend with their family. You know, what's one of the biggest blocks for people creating success? My family's going to pay the price because they think it's all about the quantity of time they spend with their family. But really it comes down to your family will take quality time over quantity time every time. You know, I could be on the other side of the planet, just spent 12 plus hours on stage. I'm wiped out. I'm burnt out. But my wife and I have an agreement that before I go to bed, even if she's 13, 14 hour time difference from me, we get on FaceTime and I love technology for that. Instead of just talking to her on the phone, we can look at each other. And even if it's only a five minute conversation, and one of the things we do is if we notice the other person drifting away because their mind's going somewhere else, we don't get upset. We don't yell and scream. We simply say, come back to me. And that's our signal that, hey, you're drifting, be present. And in that five minutes, we can have a deeper connection than most people sitting for two hours with their spouse can have because they're really not there. Their mind's trying to figure everything else out. And so that's my practice is how can I be more connected, more present, more downloading and, and, and really connected to spirit. What are you capable of? alone a lot with others, pretty much anything. It's interesting that you separated those. So here's an example of that. I told you today's a productive day. Hmm. And if I just try to do it all on my own, I can be okay. I can be good. I can be, you know, um, present. But I also know that during one of the breaks, because my wife's going to have some food for me to nourish me, I don't have to worry about that, which allows me to be even more present. You know, if there's a message to give to people, quit trying to do everything yourself. People think vulnerability is a weakness, but vulnerability is one of the greatest strengths you can have when you're willing to admit maybe what you, that you don't know what you don't know, or you're not the best at something and you allow others to have that space to assist you with it. That's a cool thing. Yeah. Having that strength to, or that's wisdom. Is it wisdom to get out of your own way or to, to, to (laughs) reflect? I think so. And sometimes it comes, you know, in Canada, we have the saying, it only takes a few kicks with the frozen muckaluck before I got it. (laughs) Cause yeah, we, I, I, and I'll speak for me. I am my own worst enemy at times and getting out of my own way. is probably one of the biggest things that people help me with because left to myself. Oh, I, I could spiral down. I, Oh, the three and a half years I took off because, you know, I had to take the time off because of my health issues, the back surgeries and that I spiraled a number of times into a very dark place. And thank goodness I had amazing people around me to, they weren't trying to always fix it because sometimes it's just holding the space to allow me to experience it. 
Because how many times do we too often try to fix things for people when the greatest thing could be allow them to experience it and get the lessons from that? So true. Tell me this, when, when's a great time to get you into a room and when's a great time to get you out of a room? <laughs> That's an interesting question. How do you answer that? Clarify. Well, I know for me, I suppose I'm, I'm creative, but not mm -hmm. detailed. Um, I, I was always joking. So the, the entrepreneurial side of me is I'll create the business, but for God's sake, don't let me run it. Yes. Now I totally get what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, pretty much the same thing. I'm great on the stage. My wife is the logistics person. <laughs> now, if I have to be and need to be, absolutely, I can do it. But mm. is it my superpower? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I've, I've been willing, and, and I guess the wording of this is important. I was, I'm willing to put the effort in to learn it because the understanding of it allows me to be greater at being a trainer, as an example. Mm. And so, you know, it's, it's not that I'll try to ignore it or say, I don't do that, or that's not my job. I will still learn it because I believe the more I understand, the better I can then be at being who I am type thing. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like you by the sound of it in many ways where let me create, you take care of the details. <laughs> you, you figure out we're all good that way. <laughs> I'm fascinated because recently it was only probably in the last literally two or three years I was sort of officially diagnosed with dyslexia and, and ADHD. And um, uh, for me, that was more useful for my for my my young girls, you know, to to really to spot if it sort of comes up with them. But the the way in which it was described to me is that um, my reading and writing would be below average. It's not that I can't; I'll just never do it for leisure or pleasure. Um, and that, that was so useful to understand. I didn't expect to get anything from the process. You know, it was more a case of, you know, it's, it's confirmed properly in me and therefore it, it is for them. But understanding that, you know, writing or reading will never, it's not something I'll do, then I can just adjust my patterns, right? And I can, I can be in my truth and say my truth is this hole in the front of my, head, my face I have no problems using, but That's just don't right. expect me to write it down. <laughs> That's right. And yeah. with technology today, like you even mentioned here, this interview, it's being transcribed. Yeah. Yeah. So why do we have to be the one that tries to do it? There's technology that can take care of that. And when you're truly present doing what you're good at, it, that's when the true power comes through and let people that, uh, you know, there's people that are brilliant at writing. Mm. So if it's not your superpower, do your superpower and let them do their superpower. My first book, when I wrote it, I did a procrastination right because every time I'd open my computer, I'd be like, I knew what I wanted to say, but before I could get it down, it was gone. And I'd get frustrated, I'd close the computer. And I'm like, a couple weeks later, I come back. Oh, and, and, I, and I went through this for a couple of years. And all of a sudden I had one, one of those one-handed claps. Do you know what a one-handed clap is, Pete? Uh, okay. <laughs> An aha moment. And it was like, mm -hmm. Robert, no wonder you're struggling writing the book. You've never written a book before, but what do you know how to do? And I have these conversations with myself all the time. I, I, I do not believe it's a problem talking to yourself. You got to get worried if you go on Facebook and make a poll and trying to figure out what part of yourself was right on that conversation or you argue, <laughs> that's when you know you have a problem. But I'm like, Robert, you don't know how to write a book, but what do you know how to do? Well, I know how to write a training. So I opened up my computer. I took the concept for my book and I wrote it into a one day training what I would like to talk about. And then I called up one of my students because this is when I was on my hiatus actually. And I called him up because he had a training company. I said, look, uh, when's your next three day training? And he told me, and I said, would it be okay if I come down and do the first day of that training? And he's like, are you kidding me? I've been waiting for you to do come and train with my students. And so I, two times I flew to Vancouver. I did the first day and now I'm in my superpower. I'm on the stage in the moment saying what I want to say and we're recording everything. And as soon as we recorded everything, we had the book. I handed it over to a ghostwriter 
She put it into the book format. I now was able to go through, yeah, like this, don't like that, change this, enhance this. And now, because I had it down in words from what in the moment was just coming through me, I wasn't having to think about it. I was just doing it. The book got written. And she put it into book format within two weeks and we were able to edit it, change it, adjust it. Cause it, and then that's why when people read my book, they're like, yeah, that sounds just like you. The whole book's written like it's you just speaking. Cause that's what it was. I didn't try to get into my head and like, how do I write this properly? <laughs> I just spoke it. And so use your superpower, but be willing to allow others to use their superpower in conjunction with you and watch how much more you can get accomplished. Why do you think the Avengers separately, they're great, but together they're powerful because they complement each other. They each have their different abilities. So do we, we're no different. It's yeah. I, and that's, uh, you, you're buying on the money because that's exactly how I did my book. I transcribed it. I spoke it, yeah. you know, and, and had somebody who was good at editing and doing all that. And, you know, uh, and, but that's, that's common. It, it's sort of going back to, you know, to really what you were talking about, I suppose, in, in terms of being open, you know, it's, and it's, it's the end part. It's the unclutter, you know, be mm -hmm. a master quitter, quit doing the stuff that just doesn't, bring you joy it doesn't serve you do whatever just unclutter right. it the most successful companies the most successful businesses have huge teams where people are doing what they're good at and even look at let's keep on the subject of books the greatest books out there if you look in the acknowledgments it's not like i want to acknowledge myself because i did everything no it's this person this person the research the this the editing the this it takes a team to do it but, you know, and, and you talk about, so one of the questions that comes up is, why do we think we have to do everything on our own? Well, if you think about it, as kids all the way up through school, we're taught to figure it out on our own. Don't get help. That's cheating. Don't copy what someone else is doing. That's cheating. So no wonder when we get, come into the real world, we think we have to do it all on our own or else we're cheating. But yet the greatest way to have success is to be willing to admit you don't know what you don't know and find someone who's good at it and get them to do that. Find someone who's done what you want to do, find out how they did it and copy what they did. That's how you get success. But our mind comes up, no, 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 I got to do it all. And no wonder we get miserable because we want to be good and we don't want to be seen as a cheater. Whole nother rabbit hole right there. <laughs> And it's so strong, isn't it? I mean, because they talk about that in Think and Grow Rich, is it Henry Ford and having the button on his desk? He's like, you know, why, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room, right? You know, it's... That's right. You know, you exactly. should be able to exactly. pick up the phone or pick up, press a button and, and get smarter people than me connected where we can feed into them, feed off them. Yeah, I was a, I was a Domino's pizza franchisee for nine years, my wife and I. And I really looked up to Tom Monaghan because... He said, when someone asked him, how is it you grew Domino's Pizza to become um, the fastest growing pizza delivery company in the world? And he said, because I hired people smarter than me. And that's plain and simple. He says, uh, he modeled Henry Ford in that way. If I'm the smartest person, I'm doing something wrong. And, and but, but I want people that agree with me. Then you are all an ego. You want to surround yourself with the people that have the different ideas and are willing and have the courage to say, no, that idea sucks. You know, you're, if you do that, it's going to crash. Yeah, maybe they don't say it that way, but you want the people that have different ideas that are brilliant at what they do. And there's a reason why you hire them. Uh, you know, look, I finally got out of my own way, Pete, where for years I've been going, oh, I've it'd probably be a good idea to have a virtual assistant. But I had all these reasons why I can't, why I can't, why I can't. Well, like three months ago, I finally found a company that really just made it so easy to bring on a virtual assistant. And they vetted someone, they did the background checks, and I'm doing the interview. And I'm sitting there and I said, okay, you know, one of the things I'm looking for help with, I said, is, I'm, I, is my social media. I said, I've got all these thousands of pictures of me on stages around the world. I never thought I could use them because they always had other advertising behind them. I said, but someone told me recently that I can actually take myself out of the picture. 
or I can blur the background. And she's like, oh, that's easy. And I'm like, of course it's easy for you. <laughs> and I hired her and it's probably been one of the best decisions I've made in the last few months because she has totally radically taken over and enhanced my social media. And I and I, I brought on, she was so good. I brought on two more virtual assistants and she oversees them. I don't even have to do the work. Every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, we get on a 10 minute call, do a work huddle. How's it going? What do I need to know? That's it. And I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> and, and it's like, I got out of my own way. Finally, on that one. Well, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, you, you, you know, that's their thing. You've got your thing. They've got their thing. It's like, yeah. if you want to create, come to me. If you want the detail done, go to them. And, and But that's yeah. their thing, right? And it lights her up to do this creative. Mm. She loves doing the social media. She, like, it, it lights her up. And now it supports her and her family. She's married, has a, a daughter. And she's thrilled. And, and, and I joke with her. I say, you know, Melissa, I, I want to apologize because she listens to my recordings and um, for any trainings I do, podcasts. I said, I want to apologize that you have to listen to my voice so many hours a day. And she goes, are you kidding me? I'm learning so much. She says, I'm getting so much out of working with you. And it's like, wow, it is that exchange back and forth. She's helping me, but at the same time, I'm also being of service and helping her to live into her greatness of her life. And what, how beautiful is that? Where are we going to see Robert in 10 years? Still doing what I do. If taking the three and a half years off taught me anything, I will never quit training. I'll never quit living my gift. And uh, so uh, I may be more virtual. I won't travel as much as I did. Uh, one of our reinvents on the what next question is a week and a half ago, I moved into my brand new office. Uh, one of my wife's vision and I for us was to build a training center on our property. We bought a beautiful acreage for the ability to do that. It was going to be something that was six, seven years down the road. Thank you, COVID, for speeding that up. Uh, we broke ground in, uh, in December of last year. And a week and a half ago, I got to start moving in. On the other side of the wall behind me is a 1,500-square-foot training center that we're going to turn into an actual um, super Zoom training facility where people, I'll do, use it most, but will, people will be able to come in and be able to have four or 500 people on the cam, you know, see them on the screens for their students. We'll have four or five cameras. We'll have a full production team behind. I'll keep doing what I love to do, which is teaching. And who, who inspires you? Who, who, you know, really sort of gets you going and, and, or has been a significant person to change, you know, change your life? Oh, there's been many uh, mentors wise. Well, probably my biggest inspiration is my wife, Roxanne, because she does, you know, she just, she's my everything. Um, I get inspired by uh, some of my greatest mentors, people like Les Brown, um, T. Harvecker, who I was his very first protege, a um, uh, gentleman by the name of um, Blair Singer, who's still my greatest mentor on being a trainer. Uh, man, there's been so many. I, I could list off dozens and dozens of people um, that I love to be inspired by. John Kehoe wrote an amazing book years ago called uh, Mind Power in the 21st Century. And then he, in 2012, released another one called Quantum Warrior, which is the next level of mind. I, it's, it's absolutely stunning. Um, Napoleon Hill, of course. I enjoyed Think and Grow Rich, but Outwitting the Devil blew me away. Love that book. So a lot of people inspire me. Hmm. Are you a big reader or follower or listener? What's your, what's your preference there for learning? I love to read. Um, I'm more, I love to be in a live training. Nothing to me will ever replace that, but I love to read, but I do it a little different than a lot of people. Um, I know that I have an addictive personality that I get into something and I can just go, go, go. So if I was just to do personal development and, and nonfiction, I, I read, I alternate my books. I'll read a nonfiction and then I get into a great fiction novel to um, separate the two and I go back and forth. And so that's how I do my reading style. Well, and tell me what's, what's a bit of a guilty pleasure for you then? My video games. <laughs> 
I was thinking it's either going to be video games or cats or yeah. cigars. I don't know why cigars came into my head, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, definitely not that. No, yeah, my video games uh, that's, mm. um, and movies. Mm. Because especially after, say, three days of hearing my voice in loudspeakers, I want to go mindless. And so I love to just get in front of a good action type movie and mm. just be absorbed in it. Favorite movie of all time? I don't know. I don't okay. know if I can say there's one. <laughs> top, top, some, one of them that's in the top three. Oh, one of them that's in the top three. Ah, oh, see, but it's not an action movie. It, you know, I still get drawn to Titanic <laughs> just because of the love story, right? Yeah. Uh, but then I, I love some of the, I love movies that are so stupid that they're funny and you're at the end you go, why did I watch that? <laughs> <laughs> so and that's where the plane trips come in because i get to watch movies that i know my wife just does not like so i'll watch those on the plane trips <laughs> it's always interesting when you look at people's netflix accounts it's like you've got one she's got one and then you've got one together you know you have to do right, right. The separate, the separate profiles you look at each other's profiles going i don't know you at all <laughs> judging yep, by, yeah. by what what do you watch when nobody's around <laughs> Oh my goodness! No kidding, no kidding. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. So, so leisure and pleasure for you then, not downtime. What what does it look like in terms of recharging for you? Oh, floating on the river, being around a campfire, hmm. going to rodeos, being with family. A lot of different things hmm. because uh, the recharge is so important. Disconnecting to reconnect. You know, yeah. uh, some of the greatest camping trips are where there's no internet. Special. Tell us, if you were to describe your fire in the belly in one or two words, what would they be? Living with passion. Three words, but I'll let you wave with it. <laughs> oh, Lord. I'm a trainer. I can't help it. <laughs> I was amazed you're so concise, actually, because normally it'd be, yeah, you know, it's like there's a whole lot more to give there. It really is. So tell us, where can people track you down, hunt you down, follow you, sign up, subscribe, stalk you, any of the above? <laughs> and all the above, yeah. Um, you know, definitely now that my Melissa has got my social media going, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Um, but, you know, because you're, you've been so gracious, uh, Pete, to have me on your podcast, the easiest thing and what I'd love to do as a gift to your audience from us is my international best-selling book, Success Left a Clue, is I would love for them to go and download the full digital copy, not just a couple chapters. The full digital copy of that book is our gift for taking their valuable time to be here. And just to do that is they just go to robertreopel.com, just my name, robertreopel.com. Um, now, of course, it is going to come with a caveat, though. I didn't write the book for some to read and then put on the shelf and make it shelf help. That's not why I wrote the book. Um, step number three in the six steps is taking action. I'm a big believer that's the biggest thing that separates success from non-success. And so I wrote the book as a workbook. And all the way through, there's action steps. And I'll actually say, did you do the last action? If not, stop reading right now. Go back and do the action before you continue reading. And so, because I, I believe that if people actually read the book and do the action steps, they'll see that there's a great impact on their life. And so that's the easiest way to stay in contact with me is by actually doing the work. So give us a shout out again for the book. So success left a clue is the, the title of the book. That's correct. Yeah. Awesome. Is there a final message you'd like to leave our listeners today? The greatest gift I believe anybody can give this planet is to be yourself. That comes through. And I think uh, it's such a strong message today. I really get it. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Robert, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Pete.